welcome to the second week in Lent. And today it is my great pleasure to uh, welcome, I'm delighted, really delighted to welcome um, my bishop, even if I uh, live in London, but being from Syria, I am under his jurisdiction. Uh, bishop Hussam uh, Naum, the new bishop, the Episcopal Bishop in, of Jerusalem. Bishop Naum was elected as a bishop at the end of January uh, 2020. So uh, we are absolutely delighted that a fresh, young, wonderful bishop with us today from uh, Jerusalem. Bishop Naum was born in Galilee and uh, his home parish is St. Paul's Anglican Church in Shafa Amr, where now uh, our dear friend, Father Fuad Dagher is, is uh, serving. Bishop uh, Naum serves as the sec secretary to the Council of Patriarchs and Heads of Churches in Jerusalem. Also, Bishop Hussam has a, a doctoral degree in ministry and leadership from the Virginia Theological Seminary, USA. And uh, Bishop Hussam is married to Rafa, and they have three children. And he lives in uh, Jerusalem, and he will tell us the date, I forgot the date, when he will um, be consecrated as the Bishop of Jerusalem. What date, Bishop uh, Hussam? May, May, May 13th. May 13th, so yeah, on, um, on Ascension Day. Ascension Day. We will keep Bishop Hussam in our prayers. And I have to say that, Bishop Hussam, forgive me. I, for the first time in since I became Anglican, 2004, I feel I belong to the Episcopal Church in the Middle East because of Bishop Hussam, who made me feel so welcome in the Diocese of Jerusalem, although I live in, um, in London. Because of that, and because of the hope we have in him in the Middle East, we are delighted to welcome you at the Awareness Foundation, Bishop Hussam, in our first official meeting, and the floor is yours. Many, many thanks, uh, Assis Nadim, Father Nadim, for uh, this wonderful introduction, and uh, I similarly feel uh, really connected uh, uh, with you and uh, with the uh, many familiar faces also who are also present with us even virtually. And uh, thank you very much uh, to you and to Awareness Foundation for this wonderful opportunity to share together, you know, some of the uh, blessings of Lent uh, and uh, this journey, this Lenten journey that we all are working walking together as people of God and as the body of Christ. Um, uh, my, my presentation will be um, uh, twofold. Uh, the first part will be uh, about text uh, from Isaiah 58 and, uh, and, and the small reflection. And after that, I will uh, go deeper into uh, worship, prayer, and uh, Lent fasting uh, through the storm, uh, which is the theme of our uh, uh, session this evening. So thank you very much again for this opportunity and uh, please prepare your pens and thoughts for uh, questions and, uh, and remarks and comments as we go along. And I will be happy also to share uh, with you some of the answers uh, that, that are the, as for the questions that are in your hearts. And um, uh, basically this hour will be divided into two sections, uh, presentation and then some questions you know, uh, cues and A's uh, after after the presentation. I will be reading the text from uh, Isaiah 58 to begin with, and uh, then we will delve into uh, the reflection itself. 58, Isaiah 58, one to seven. Shout out, do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet, announce to my people their rebellion, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet day after day they seek me and delight to know my ways, as if were a nation that 
practice righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near God. Why do we fast, but you do not see? Why humble ourselves, but you do not notice? Look, you serve your own interest on the day, on your fast day, and oppress all your workers. Look, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to strike with a wicked fist. Such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose, a day to humble yourself? Is it to bow down the head like a, bull, a bulrush and to lie in sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose to lose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring to the homeless, bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked to cover them and not to hide yourself from your own kin. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The text from Isaiah is not only a rich text, but also a challenging one. The prophet Isaiah presents the prophecy that uh, was given to him by the Lord in order to deliver to the people of his time. And this word will stay for generations to come. The Lord is not pleased with the people because of their sin and rebellion. The people are confronted with their false worship, their false prayer. They act as if they know the way of the Lord. They pretend to practice righteousness and claim to have obeyed the Lord's commands. And above all, they deceive themselves by pretending that they draw near to God, that they become closer to God. They feel that God is not accepting their worship, nor is, is he pleased with their fasting, their worship, and their prayer. They ask, why do we fast, but you do not see? Why humble ourselves, but you do not notice? God responds to their questions and confronts their own deceit. Their own concern is their interest and benefit. They oppress the people. They fight among themselves. They do evil to one another. The Lord confronts them with, their, with his own questions. Is such the first that I choose? Is it humiliation? Is it about being or sitting in sackcloth and ashes? Let me tell you, says the Lord, what fasting is all about. To lose the bonds of injustice, to let the oppressed go free, to share your bread with the hungry, to offer hospitality, to help the poor, and not to ignore your neighbor. In other words, fasting, fasting, prayer, and worship is actually the body, is the, actually is the nourishment for the soul. You know, one of the incredible experiences in life is to feel helpless and to see yourself as weak and vulnerable in the situation you find yourself in. The weight and strength that you normally feel is no longer there. You feel as if you are tossed by the wind in all directions and you end up feeling nothing but lost and disoriented. There are many people around the world today who find themselves in a similar situation. Situations of war, loss, starvation, disease, pandemic, and other human circumstances in which people look for a sign of hope and life in the midst of suffering and death. The human experience for, from, from a Christian perspective depends so much on the divine. Human beings seek to be in the presence of the holy in most situations of celebration, joy, and thanksgiving, but are most dependent and desperate for the divine intervention when they feel that all signs of life, light, and hope seem to be lost. Praying and fasting through the storm is a very meaningful title for us Christians. 
but at the same time it carries with it human experiences which should not be taken lightly especially at these exceptional and weird times of COVID-19. There are all kinds of storms, metaphorically speaking. Some of them are imposed on us and we are helpless when they come. Other kinds of storms are, for better or worse, choose to in or invite ourselves into. I would like to take the story of Jesus calming the storm as one of my main pericopes and texts in this presentation, the Sea of Galilee or Gennesaret or Kenneret is only a small lake which normally is very calm, except that boats sometimes have great difficulty sailing against the currents on a windy day or night. The other text I would like to focus on is the book of Job in the Hebrew scriptures, which, which we Christians call the Old Testament story of a righteous man who was afflicted with disasters and hardships. Job's luxurious life was turned to a very weak place in the heart of the storm. Lastly, we cannot talk about prayer and worship life and experience, particularly when we address the theme of distress, hardships and challenges without referring to the book of Psalms. The psalmist introduces to us a whole life of prayer and spiritual encounters. This presentation is about the life of prayer in times of distress. And I am not surprised that I'm doing this topic, praying and fasting through the storm coming from the Middle East makes this theme very appropriate. And I thank Reverend Nadim again for inviting me to share some of my thoughts and life experience of the church in the Middle East. I believe two important definitions are needed to be to, uh, needed for this presentation, and they are uh, prayer or worship, of course, and fasting being form of a prayer and storm. In the context of this address, these two definitions will uh, not only inform each other, but they are intertwined, they are interconnected. Worship, especially in time of distress, is quite complex and has more facets than any other kind of prayer or intercession or worship. Prayer for us Christians in time is a time or space where human beings search for the divine in a troubled situation. Often this type of prayer seek, makes sense uh, of where God is in a particular situation. The other aspect of that prayer is why does God allow such a situation to destroy a person, a community, a nation, or even the world, especially if they are godly people who fear, who fear God? God, for us Christians, is the creator of all things. He is to be respected and obeyed even in times when we feel that we have nothing to do with him. Prayer in time of distress is the kind of prayer which invites the human spirit to delve into a time of questions and queries about our relationship with God. When we spend quality time and endless effort in prayer, we find ourselves facing two main questions. The first is, who is God for me? Who is God for us in this particular situation? And the other, who am I to God in this particular situation? And from these two questions derive many, many other questions. Who is God whom I meet in the most unlikely places? What does God look like? How do I imagine God? And on the other hand, who am I in, the, in God's eyes? When God looks at me, what does he see? How does God deal with our human experiences? It takes us a long spiritual journey, and I say even it takes us a whole lifetime journey to answer these questions. But because we need a continuous growth into the way we perceive God, as well as a need to see ourselves through the eyes of God, through God's eyes. These two questions may arise either implicitly or explicitly because the time of prayer and fasting is a time of meeting with God. 
There is an old saying which is attributed to Ignatius of Loyola that we should pray as if everything depends on God and work as if everything depends on us. I think it could make a better sense if it is reversed. Pray as if everything depends on you, work as if everything depends on God. This gives more urgency and importance to prayer. We need actually to get ourselves to pray and be in the presence of God, be in the presence of the Holy. Working is important. We do what we ought to do, but the outcome depends entirely on God. On the other hand, the term storm in a Christian spirituality context has, has a variety of meanings over and especially and had varied of meanings over the two millennia. But most of them lead us to the same conclusion that is living through a time of difficulty and distress. The COVID-19 pandemic is an obvious example and a common example for the whole world today. In the case of any human individual or community which goes through a rough time, their reflection on the situation can lead to a response which we call prayer. Storms often cause hurt and pain or even death. Storms cause human person to be vulnerable or even weak, thus leading that person to search for a place of refuge or a stronghold or shelter. This greater power we Christians call God or the divine. Human beings experience different kinds of storms, financial storms, emotional storms, spiritual storms, physical storms, political storms, and the list goes on and on. How do we deal how and how we feel in the midst of the storm? This question will be one of the main focuses of this presentation. The human experience which had been shaped by a storm or storms can lead in many cases to human maturity, growth and transformation in the divine. The journey of faith of the human person can be informed by experiences of hardship and distress. In some cases, storm may claim people's lives or lead to the destruction of the whole community. That's why some storms are experiences which can result either in the illumination or in the elimination of life. Also storms are impartial. Being Christian does not exempt us from the difficulty and challenges of life. Sometimes storms are the result of our own misdoing. The story of Jonah is an example of this kind of storm. Disobeying God is one way which could result in experiencing a stormy life. Some other storms come as a result of our bad choices, and we sometimes suffer the consequences. Often storms come even when we are doing the right thing. This kind of storm is like the one Job experienced. For me, the book of Job is one of the most fascinating books of the Hebrew scriptures. Many of us identify with Job, uh, though on a much smaller scale. The book, of of the book of Job is a story of a righteous man who is chosen by Satan to be tempted to prove that there is no human on earth who is loyal to God. For Satan, most people believe in God, not on the basis of their faith or trust, but rather because they live a less challenging life. Having said that, God allows Satan to touch all aspects of Job's life except life itself. The first chapter and a half tell us how Satan convinced God to allow him to test Job in, and his faith in God. And it goes on to describe how Job lost everything he possessed, including his own children and his health. After Job lost all that he had, he refused to curse God. Instead, he cursed the day he was born. Job did not lose hope, but he was frustrated and disappointed to the point of death. Job's wife could not comprehend what had happened to them, and she was ready to let go. 
She said to her husband, do you still per persist in your integrity? Curse God and die. In Hebrew, it, it reads, bless God and die, which is a euphemism. Job was not happy that this suggestion told and told his wife, shall we receive the good at the hand of God and not receive the bad? Neither Job's wife nor his friends managed to comfort him. His wife suggested that he should curse God and die, and his friends blamed him because he quarreled with God and did not accept God's judgment. Job answered his friends and tried to explain why he was upset. And I quote, Oh, that my vexation and we, uh, were weighed, and all my calamity laid in balances. For then, it would be heavier than the sand of the sea. It's so much to bear. One of the most common questions asked by people of faith who have been through a storm is, why me? Why me, Lord? I love you. I believe in you. I have faith in you. Why me? Job also asked a similar question saying, what have I done to deserve this treatment? For I have not denied the words of the Holy One. Job also explaining what he was going through. The storm is very hard on him. And he went on to say, the storm, the storm is very hard on him. And from these, from the eye of the storm, he says, what is my strength that I should wait? And what is my end that I should be patient? Is my strength the strength of stones or is my flesh bronze? Job is speaking out from within the eye of the storm, inflicted with disease, pain, sorrow, loss, perplexity. Job is trying to make sense of the situation he's in. He says, for God crushes me with the storm and multiplies my wounds without cause. Job feels that he has been treated unfairly and ask his friends to be fair to him. Job disappointed with his friends and their wisdom and told them, I have heard many such things. You are all miserable comforters. They did not only insult him for his doubting spirit, but also accused him of sin, simply because he is asking, why me? Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind, out of the storm. He commended Job for his faith and words and rebuked his friends for their foolishness. God said to Elphaz, one of his friends, for I accept his prayer not to deal with you according to your folly. And the Lord accepted Job's prayer. Then the Lord restored the fortunes of Job and blessed his latter days. The interesting thing is that Job does not get an answer to the question that he poses at the beginning, which is in brief, why me? But much more importantly, he meets with God. Job's story was become, has become one of the most inspirational narratives in human history with regard to patience, comfort, and endurance. Our Anglican liturgist and of course, many other churches value the contribution of Job toward many of our pastoral services, and especially the funeral liturgy. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked sh I shall return to the Lord. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now turning to the Psalms, Psalms are treasuries of written prayers which reflect a wide scheme of spiritual life and large spectrum of experiences and encounters with the Holy One. This includes times of joy, peace, celebration, and gratitude, and also time of trouble, distress, and desperation, and also lamentation. The psalmist present to us sincere prayers and that derive from desperate circumstances. These prayers show utter dependence on God and allow the human person to face difficulties and hardships with courage. The encounter with God in different circumstances are a source 
of vocation, transformation, and renewal. I will take part of Psalm 69 as an example of desperate prayer. And these are verses 13 to 15. But as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord, at an acceptable time, O God, in the abundance of your steadfast love, answer me. With your faithful help, rescue me from, the sink, from sinking in the mire. Let me be delivered from my enemies and from, my, from the deep waters. Do not let the flood sweep over me. Or the deep swallow me up, or the pit close its mouth over me. This psalm is a prayer offered by the psalmist in a time of helplessness and suffering. The psalmist is quite sure that God knows his suffering. The psalmist trusts that God is a God of love and compassion and somehow believes that his suffering will turn out for the good. And this reminds us of St. Paul's own words, which he wrote to the people in Rome. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose in Romans chapter 8. Prayer in the heart, mind, and soul of the psalmist is reaching out for God's steadfast love and faithfulness, dealing with his own fear and anxiety, the psalmist turns to God for peace and refuge. We need to turn to God in the midst of distress. Often we turn to everything else or everyone else but God. We need to turn to God in humility and reverence and always seek forgiveness. Desperate prayers should always end with thanksgiving and praise because of the unchanging character of God and because of his goodness and faithfulness. We need to see God and we need to search for God at all times. God should not be the last resort in time of trouble and distress, but should be the first one to call upon because God is the God of encouragement. The psalmist reaches us or teaches us, therefore, that prayer through the storm, fasting through the storm, worshiping through the storm is a journey that leads us to a meeting place with God where we see him face to face in that place of meeting, we also discover that God has, the, has been there all along. Now, calming the storm, especially in the, in the Gospel of Mark, and we find it, of course, in all synoptic Gospels, but the, one, the story of, the, of calming the sea and the wind is one of the most comforting miracles in the, in the New Testament with regard to facing hardships and persecution. Christians for centuries have been inspired by the story of Jesus calming the sea and the storm. The miracle, as I mentioned, is documented in all three Gospels of Mark, Luke, and, and Matthew. But for the sake of presentation, I would like to concentrate on one verse in the Markan account. That is in chapter 4, verses, verse 38. But Jesus was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and the disciples woke him up and said, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Lord, do you not care? This is one of the most common questions people ask in time of peril and danger. Our search for God during these times is part of our longing for safety and refuge in, time, in times of desperation and distress. The search, for long, the search and longing for a soft and comfortable life is almost an instinct of the human condition, which is chiefly driven by fear and anxiety. Going through the storm, the disciples were frightened and went to Jesus asking him for help. Jesus rebuked their doubt and fear and asked them, why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? Jesus is there with us and he accompanies us through the storms, even though at times it may seem as if is, he is not concerned, he's unconcerned, or in the case of the disciples, sleeping. Do you not care, Lord? When we read the story of Jesus calming the sea, we look at every detail in the story. 
you know, we, look, we look at the wind and the waves and the storm, the disciples' fear and anxiety, the lack of faith. Jesus' power to save, his authority over the powers of nature. However, we forget or ignore the calm Jesus or Jesus the calm. His non-anxious presence help us in times of peril, danger, and storm. We call upon Jesus in storms of our lives, and we discover that he is there walking beside us, even though we can't see or feel him. The fact is that Jesus comes and meets us. Places such as uh, Jerusalem, Bethlehem, Beirut, Damascus, Baghdad, and other places within our region and even our world today have witnessed huge storms of different kinds. Today, thousands of refugees are displaced and people are suffering in foreign lands as a result of violence and bloodshed. Christians and non-Christians are living through a storm of extremism and terrorism. These innocent people are trying to make sense of what is happening to them and praying very diligently to God Almighty to look upon them and deliver them from their distress. The Christian community in the Middle East was once majority in the area, but is now a tiny minority. The Holy Land, for example, according to recent statistics, Christians do not exceed 1.4% of the population. Less than 250,000 Christians of all denominations still live in the land where Christianity was born. The recent wars, conflicts, have caused many Christians to feel, uh, actually caused many Christians to flee and to other countries in the West in search for safety and freedom, while others choose to stay because they believe that the Holy Land cannot afford to be left without its living stones. The storm of the pandemic hitting our world at this time had made, has made life for our people and I'm sure around the world, for our institutions, a challenging one. Many people lost their jobs, health, and even their lives because of the virus. As people of God, both locally and internationally, we are crying in one voice, Lord, do you not care? I will finish this address with a prayer attributed to St. Ignatius of Loyola, who prayed, O Christ Jesus, when all is darkness and we feel our weakness and helplessness, give us the sense of your presence, your love, and your strength. Help us to have perfect trust in your protecting love and strengthening power, so that nothing may frighten or worry us, for living close to you, we shall see your hand, your purpose, and your will through all things. Amen. Amen, Sayyidna. Bishop Hussam, thank you so much thank you. for this thought-provoking and challenging uh, presentation of the prayer, fasting, and worship in the time of storm. And um, I have questions <laughs> from uh, here and from Facebook. But first of all, I want to, uh, you, you provoked my imagination when, when you said uh, we need to know what kind of God, what is the shape of God, what kind of God, who is the God that we, we believe in, as much as God would ask, who am I that he cares, cares for? And I want to ask you, <clears throat> what kind of God, how does God look like for a Christian that is facing so many storms in the Middle East? No, I, I do believe that uh, being myself in the Middle East, I, I feel that my God is uh, the God of love and faithfulness. I feel that uh, God is a God whom I trust. And, um, and today, you know, talking about God in, in, in a broad sense as well within our communities, within our churches, within, within the society we live in, God calls us to be a community of faith and a community of hope, even in a time of distress. 
you know, we are called to be uh, our true self as human beings and also not only accept, accept pain because, you know, that this is something that we as human beings, you know, we always tend to reject. But, you know, this time of Lent re reminds us, you know, through the liturgy, especially of Ash Wednesday, uh, uh, remember that you are dust and to dust you shall return. This means that our true self, our, our own humanity created in the image of God, is actually an invitation to, uh, to reveal the simplicity of our humanity, which is totally dependent on the holy. Now, our search for God is our search for God, even through the storms, is actually meeting with God and finding solace, finding comfort and succor in these times. Thank you very much. Um, Father Joe is asking, Bishop, thank you for your wise thoughts. Having spent much time on military uh, operations and the, anal the analogy of the storm resonate strongly. I find that adversity or the storm to be a, spiritual, a spiritually cleansing time where trivial matters are washed away allowing us to see God and ourselves more clearly. Does this reflect your experience? Now, indeed, indeed, uh, that, that indeed reflects my experience. And uh, I, I have to say, I referred in my, in my reflection uh, on two kinds of storms. There's one storm that you, you are helpless in it and you find yourself suddenly that you are just being tossed here and there and, there, and almost you, must, you, have, you can do nothing. But, you know, there are other storms which we ourselves, you know, bring ourselves into or basically the human experience and the human greed uh, and, um, you know, our love for authority and dominion uh, and not accepting the other. You know, these, these human experiences, you know, have created, especially in the Middle East, uh, quite a turmoil where we are trying uh, to understand the situations that we live in and also you know reflect at our presence you know as as christians especially as christians but also as 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 people as humans because we know that you know there's the, our communities are diverse here in the middle east but the idea is that you know um, to have that experience of being cleansed by a certain experience i would accept that in a sense that uh, the, the experience itself like what happened with job it becomes, it's, it becomes a vocation. It becomes a time of growth and strength. And I, and I believe that, you know, walking uh, uh, alongside Jesus or Jesus walking alongside us, you know, to teaches us how to, and help, help us actually, how to um, live through these storms and to come to the shore of quietness and calmness. And no, no, whether we, we realize that or not, but we know that our, our um, experience is not in vain. And we have the true home that leads us eventually to where God is and where we see him face to face. Um, from Chris uh, asking, is Job to be understood as a real man or is the story a myth containing timeless truths about God and Satan? <clears throat> no, I, this is a, it's a very good question. And I think, you know, for me personally, uh, it's not that it doesn't matter, but I think it doesn't matter whether it is, it is historic or not historic. The fact is that the, the virtues and the, and, and, and the spiritual lessons that we learn through that story is enormous. Uh, it's the way our lives, and as I said, whether historic or not, it, it reflects each and, each and every one of us. And we find ourselves in the text. And as I said, even sometimes on a smaller scale, yeah, we don't, not everyone experienced what Job experienced. But to tell you the truth here in the Middle East, and I'm, I've seen it even in Africa and other places, also we hear about it. You know, there are people who have lost their families, they have lost their homes, they have lost their health, they are handicapped or they are... Uh, disabled because of such calamities, but you know, at least they cling on to life because they know that they have a message, they have a purpose in this life and also in the life to come. So I think, you know, the, 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 the real question is, where do I find myself in the story of Job? 
and how can I meet God, even though I don't have answers to all my questions. Thank you, Bishop. Um, a question from the Facebook from a young woman, Elsa, says, as a young person in the Middle East, where would I get hope from in this time of storms, especially when I see the church is so divided? Young people are asking such questions all the time, uh, Sayyidna. Where do I get hope from when I see storm hitting me and that the church is divided? I, I have I have two two thoughts on this question, and I think you know I myself I myself had these questions on my heart for many many years, and I I I, I can hear so many people asking the same question, and it is a legitimate one, you know, because our young people are so much thirsty for uh, for intervention not only divine one but also a human one and and more likely ecclesial one so to speak because they want to see their church caring for them and worrying about them for me searching deep in my heart and looking around me i i i, I felt and i feel that there are two main things one is that hope our real hope and especially for someone who's who comes from Jerusalem and who lives in Jerusalem. You know, uh, the, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre or the image of the empty tomb is a wonderful anchor for my faith. And it is a sign of hope and it is a sign of victory. Why? Because I know that God um, has given us such life through the risen Lord. We have, you know, life has the final word and not death. Therefore, you know, I think having that image uh, embedded in our faith and in our spiritual life gives us so much strength that we shall overcome. Yes, we are going through difficulty, but I think we need to cling on. We need to be steadfast in our presence and in our lives here because I cannot imagine this land, I can't imagine this land and this region without its living stones. It was, it became a mission, you know, a personal mission uh, for myself. And, you know, to tell you the honest truth, I have had so many offers to, to work abroad. But I, I chose not to do that. And I, I said to myself that I belong to this place and I will be here. Maybe you think now I'm a bishop, maybe you come more on a, uh, the kind of the advantaged end of uh, the church life. But, but at the same time, I lived as a young man and as a young priest in difficult situations, in, in war zones. And I, I, I felt uh, so much in, in a place where uh, Job felt like, I said, what am I doing in this place? But, you know, my faith kind of brought me back and anchored me in that place. The second one is actually my hope in the community that we as, as people, we also come around to support each other. You know, if I was on my uh, on my own and by myself, I would not last one minute. But because I have so much support from my, my sisters and brothers in Christ and also even beyond my faith, you know, we are, are here and we will continue to be together because that's the only way we can survive. So I think finding even among the so-called division of the church, but we need to remember that there is only one body of Christ. We have one baptism, we have one faith, we have one Lord, and we need to see these signs of hope within our own understanding what the church is all about, and that's how we can support each other. Again, a whole journey is meeting with God in the here and now. Uh, thank you very much, Sayyidna. Um, Richard saying uh, here in Zoom, Bishop, I was privileged to walk in uh, walk the shores of Galilee and felt I was experiencing God, love and peace as Jesus would have taught. Moving to Jerusalem was a different experience yes. of political uh, intrigue, division, almost as it was in Jesus' time. Does this reflect your experience, Sayyidina? Mm. Yeah, well, this is this is a, <laughs> a very good question, and I I hope you know like the people of Jerusalem will not uh, quote me on this, but uh, 
But, uh, you know, like, I think, you know, coming from Galilee myself, I, I am not biased in a sense, but because I, I grew up in Galilee, uh, it, is, it is more green than any other part of the Holy Land to begin with. Uh, the the uh, typology and and the and the geography and and the and the and the the scape the landscape is is different on the one hand, uh, but at the same time you know Galilee has been always even through history uh, a bit kind of distant from uh, the the problems and the and the quarrels and and but at the same time I have to say uh people normally don't fight on things that are not so precious you know they choose the places that mean a lot to fight over and that's why jerusalem is a is a different tick is a different place and the and and you will find that because of the status of jerusalem and because of the character of jerusalem you will find you know so many um, liars there's so many uh, uh, agendas there are so many people who wanting to possess Jerusalem, and they forget that Jerusalem belongs uh, first and foremost to God, like many other, like any other place in the world. People forget that they are custodians or guardians of these places that God has chose to, to make them very special. And there, no wonder that Jesus, when he uh, stood at, uh, you know, at the slopes of Mount, uh, the Mount of Olives, and he cried over Jerusalem and he said, you know, Jerusalem, you, you don't know what is for your peace. And uh, unfortunately, it's the people who are fighting who don't know the peace of Jerusalem and what Jerusalem can bring, not only to Jerusalem itself, but for the world. You know, this place is, there's so much human intervention in it that uh, I think people don't understand what Jerusalem is all about. That's my, at least my take, but I definitely identify with your experience. But I think with this, with this uh, huge calamity around Jerusalem comes great spiritual benefits. And that's why Jerusalem is a special place. So you are recommending us to visit Jerusalem then? There is no, there is no question about that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sayyidna. Another question from Canada, Huda is saying, where do you see God's hand in the middle of the storm in the Middle East? Do you no, see the, I, God's hand? Yeah, I, I think I see God's hand. Um, let me say, like, of course, this is a very broad question and it's a very important question. But, you know, the way I see, see it, even though I, I referred to my, in my reflection about how people are uh, displaced and uh, we have refugees and we have persecuted communities we and we have witnessed over the years a lot of extremism and fanaticism and terrorism and all of that and also we have seen also invasions and so the the political reality of the middle east is is, is not an easy one uh, that can we speak uh, about it like in a few minutes or even in hours uh, but what i want to say that i saw the hand of god in countries in the in the west that have given shelter to the people who are homeless people who were who are dying in the on the shores of the seas and people who were pulled from the actual storms inside the sea and being taken as refugees now i see the hand of god uh, looking after uh, uh, these people who are in peril and distress through the gift of so many gracious people around the world, both locally and internationally. Um, and at the same time, of course, we are helpless. We are helpless at the effect of these storms that take so many lives and has, have, has taken so many lives uh, of our own people. Uh, blood was shed in, in, in many countries. But, you know, at the same time, we know that, you know, our human frailty and as I mentioned in my reflection, the greed and the and the, dom the, dom the domination of of people, you know, result in so many uh, affliction uh, and so many uh, pain and uh, and uh, and also distress among the people. So therefore, I think I've given a few examples, but I also see the hand of God that things are changing um, um, in some places for the better and in other places for the worse. But at least. 
we we see a light in, at the end of the tunnel. And uh, I hope that you know uh, that the future will bring us uh, um, uh, better days for our for us and for our children. And that's why we are anchored here, you know, because we believe that one day, you know, we shall live in peace and harmony and dignity, of, uh, first and foremost, in this place which we call home. Thank you, Sayyidna, very much. Tom is asking here, when Christ commands us to forsake everything, take up our cross and follow him, isn't the storm and its attendant suffering just another step on the way? No, indeed. Uh, I, I think, you know, the, one of the things that the disciples um, did not understand, and it took them a long time to do so, um, and, and even the Bible tells us it's only after the resurrection and the and Pentecost that they realized fully what, what Jesus was telling them, is that they couldn't accept the fact that Jesus is going to suffer uh, and die. Uh, the, their denial, their denial of what Jesus was telling them should happen, you know, kind of, I think, first and foremost, of course, they were concerned about their own master and teacher. But at the same time, they were concerned about themselves, not only the loss of their teacher, but also what could happen to them if their master is going to, to go through these things, what will be the case for them? Therefore, you know, our denial and rejection of the cost of discipleship is always on our hearts as people of God. And I think, you know, Jesus, through these words and through this very specific verse, you know, he teaches us the cost of discipleship. You know, is it cheap grace, as uh, Dietrich Benhofer uh, writes, or is it costly grace that we should seek after? You know, I think if we're looking for a cheap grace, we, we are not realistic and we want the easy way and the wide uh, gate. But if we know the, the, the cost of discipleship through the cross and for self-denial, and following Jesus on the way, we know the, the, the virtues and the blessings that the Narragate will bring into our lives. Now, I think this is, this is exactly what should be our case. In our case, we should also reflect at our own journey of faith. What does it mean for us to be and to become a disciple of Jesus and to follow him on the way? Um, Sayyid, now we, we do want to believe um, that our God is the God of compassion. But in the, in the, in the eye of the storm, mm. fear kicks in. You, you touched on, on, on fear. Yes. So yes. where do we get the courage from? Young people who are leaving the Middle East, who are throwing themselves in the sea yes. to leave the, the, the region. Um, when, when they are, they have lost everything. So hopelessness and the eye of the storm. How, how do we get to, to help them to get the courage, Sayyidna? You know, I, I, I think, you know, to be honest, uh, Aziz Nadim, um, you know, this is, this is an existential question. Uh, it's a question that, um, that sh should, should not be taken lightly and to kind of offer um, nice words to it, because I think I feel humbled um, um, to, to, to answer this question. Honestly speaking, you know, for many, many, many people around the world, it's easy for us to say, no, you should hang in and you should have faith. God is a faithful God and all of that. But if your hand is in the fire, if your life is at stake, if you are ready to danger, you know, and to put your life at risk because of fleeing a situation, you know, it's, it's not, it's not an, an easy life and it's not an easy answer. You know, what I can say is that I humbly offer my prayer that God will have compassion on these people, on, on all of us, especially those who are living in distress, those who are living and facing the calamities of life, that they will see better days and, you know, the, the evil um, actions of people and whether it is the natural disasters of the pandemic or anything that, 
God will really upon, look upon us all and bring us better days. That's what I can say. And, and we all, of course, ready to give encouragements and prayers and support as much as we can uh, in order to make these, these people feel safer, uh, feel uh, that they are people who care for them. And uh, there are certain things we can do and there are certain things we can't. But at the same time, it's if each and every one of us did one drop or give, gave only one little thing, imagine what would happen to our world uh, that is hungry, that is oppressed, that is facing violence and bloodshed. I think, you know, this is a call. This question is actually an urgent call to each and every one of us. And to beginning with me, to renew our commitment to our sisters and brothers who are in distress and facing calamity. And thank you for that person who asked this question. Last question from Father Jim. Um, what is saving you personally at this time of storm? And um, what is exciting for you in the midst of our wild world? And how can we help? Father Jim. Sayyidna. Father Jim, thank you. Thank you, Father Jim. I think, you know, since I was in, uh, in, uh, in Virginia, in Virginia Theological Seminary, there's one course I've taken uh, on spirituality. And uh, we came across... And I don't know if it is a coincidence or not that I quoted twice Ignatius of Loyola. Uh, and the, we are reminded of the examine and the spiritual exercises and all of that. But I, I read then uh, a book, a very small, like very small book. It's a booklet, actually. It's called Sleeping with Bread. And um, that, that book speaks about the examine and gives um, basically a practice uh, of the examine uh, through two questions that you ask yourself either personally or around the table at dinner with your family and it becomes a family practice, spiritual practice where we ask ourselves two questions. The first, what is uh, what has happened in the day or the week depending on the frequency of when you do that and how you do it. What is the desolation in your life at this time? So one name, one thing that is really making you weary, making you he heavier, make, is on your heart that has taken you, has taken a lot of energy of yourself. And then the other question is, what is the consolation? Uh, one name, one consolation that happened in your life uh, at this time. And actually, you know, after doing that every day, you become uh, to think not only about these things that are happening in your life, but actually you begin to work out how you can see God in these situations, in times of joy, as well as in times of distress. So that was my practice, and I still do that quite often because it, keep, it keeps me focused. It keeps me focused not on my life as a person only, but it also keeps my eyes focused on my Lord and Savior, on Jesus, who is calm. And I think, and I deliberately use the word now, the term uh, looking in the, in the storm, uh, calming the storm, is we often miss uh, Jesus the calm or calm Jesus. Because Jesus, who is calm in his way, sleeping on a cushion and all of that, even though he is calm, but he is so much aware of what is going around us. And he will never desert us. And it takes a life journey, again, to, to realize these blessings uh, that, that happen in our lives. And these are my sources of consolation, honestly speaking, that I always remind myself that Jesus is walking beside me. And when I see only two footprints, uh, on the sand, I know that Jesus is carrying me through. Thank you very much, uh, Sayyidna. Do you have any last message to us as a foundation or the, who, the audience listening to you? No, before indeed. We close? Yes, thank, uh, first of all, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, thank you all who are present with us on Zoom and those who are watching us uh, now. And 
and the special thanks to uh, to Huda and uh, to Assis Nadim uh, for their invitation and for being here together uh, and for making this opportunity that we share together uh, what is on our hearts and to hear your encouragements. And you know, one way of doing uh, more about this is uh, through supporting uh, uh, our ministries. And uh, definitely supporting the Ministry of Awareness Foundation is an important thing because I think I see in awareness a hub that brings the East and the West together, if I may say so, um, uh, through prayer, through support, and also through raising awareness about the people in the Middle East. And we are indebted to you and, and to many, many people who uh, never um, 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 been reluctant, uh, but to share and to support. So please keep us in your prayers um, uh, as people in the Middle East. Uh, we ask you also to, uh, to come and visit when you have a chance. Uh, and please continue to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And uh, because if there is peace in Jerusalem, there is peace throughout the world, because Jerusalem is the city of peace, the city of the resurrection. So thank you very, very much again, and may God bless you and your ministries and your lives and your families. We are delighted to have you, Sayyidna. Thank you so much for your encouraging, uh, challenging, and comforting words at the same time. We are delighted to have you at the Awareness Foundation Awareness Live. Thank you all on Zoom and on Facebook. Again, we are delighted to have you, Sayyidna. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation at Lent. And may God bless you all and blessed Lent to all of you.